Right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to worship. It's wonderful to see so many people here in the midst of uh, the weather and uh, warnings and things like that. God is good. We're here. Um, and uh, we pray uh, that God uh, looks after the whole of New Zealand uh, this weekend. But um, should we stand? Should we let's uh, celebrate the goodness of God with I'm trading my sorrow? sorrows I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, anyway. I am blessed but not crushed, persecuted and not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure, that his joy is gonna be my strength. Through the sorrow only lasts for the night, it's joy coming in the morning. Yeah. 
Peace be with you all. Good morning. If you are here for the first time or visiting, I am Becky, one of the ministers here, and it is awesome to see you here on this kind of start of a wild day. As Barbara pointed out, this is just a normal day for Wellington. So all you Wellingtonians, you're just at home right now, okay? And we just hope it won't get too much worse. Uh, we have got a whole bunch of notices today, um, so we're going to start off straight away. We've got our week of prayer this week, and as you know, we like to commit everything that we do to the Lord, um, and we do that through our prayer and our prayer together. So we came together on Thursday night, and there will be another opportunity to do that straight after the service today. So we are looking forward to praying together for our church, for the world, for our community. The next thing is we've got another prayer opportunity for GCK. There's a prayer meeting on Monday the 13th of February. And what time is that, Sarah? Nine o'clock-ish here in the family room, right? Yeah. So come along to that one and pray for our kindy and uh, all the families and the children who are there and the teachers as well. We have a newcomer's lunch, so if you are new or if you have never been to a newcomer's lunch, <laughs> um, feel free to come along. Uh, it's at Chris and my place, and we'd love to host you and just let you know a little bit more about the church and what we do here and the vision we have. So please come along, and um, you need to RSVP to the office, please. So just drop Shireen a little email saying you'd like to come along, and you are more than welcome. All right, last week we asked for people to sign up for Sunday duties, and as you know, our service doesn't happen without the help of all of you. So um, we are in need of a few different areas. So on your way out today, maybe you could have a look um, at the sheets that are just out in the foyer and pop your name down for something. We're not going to call for you to do it every single week, okay? So when you put your name down, you're not signing up for every week for your lifetime, um, but it might be once a month or something like that. So please feel free to do that, and you're not signing up forever, okay? You can, you know, come off that and join something else. Keep it fresh. Um, and so that's a really cool opportunity for each of us to serve and to be part of making this happen for everybody, which I know is a huge blessing to us all on a Sunday. We have on that kind of vibe, we've got an open day for the sound desk so, um, and how to do PowerPoint. So if, you, um, if that's a passion for you or that's a skill for you, um, please attend that. But we talk to... Mark Yo. There's Mark. He's got his hand up. Go and talk to that guy. He is fabulous with all things technical. So please go and see Mark. Uh, you didn't want to add anything to that, did you? 
No, all good, all right. Um, Brad, come on up. Uh, just one quick notice for those who are parents of kids at Glendowie School. So you probably saw there's an announcement that they're going to discontinue any form of religious education there. Um, if you'd like to think about a collective response from us um, parents of, of kids who go there, then if you can meet with me back corner directly after the service before the other prayer meeting. So normally it takes people a bit, bit of time to get organised for that one, so we'll sneak in there before that. It'll be five minutes for a quick chat to see if people want to make a collective response there. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. It's really good to be proactive about this because we care about our school, don't we? So um, please come along to that. All right, it is time now for our um, kids and youth to go out. And you are all meeting in the lounge today. So youth, don't run off into the kindy just yet. So um, if you want to follow Sarah and the leaders out there. And as the kids go... Um, we're going to take up our offering as well, and I'm just going to pray for both of those things as we do. So Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we have such wonderful children and youth in our church. Lord, I give you thanks for them, and I give you thanks for our wonderful leaders who uh, give up their time and are so passionate about teaching them. So Father, I pray for a blessing on our kids and youth program this morning. Um, and Lord, I also pray for our offering as we Remember that uh, giving financially is a really important spiritual discipline. And uh, Lord, everything that we have comes from you and we are just giving back. Uh, we are stewards of the gifts that you give to us. And so Father, as we take up the offering today, whether it's through cash or um, the envelopes or through automatic payment, Lord, we pray that you bless those offerings, Lord, that you multiply them uh, for the use in your kingdom, Lord, that every dollar that's given goes towards um, making our GPC a wonderful church, a welcoming place, and um, helping each one of us to be equipped and encouraged to reach out to those who do not yet know you, Lord. So we pray um, for all of that in your holy name. Amen. I wanted to focus us um, on a verse this morning. It says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So this week, we're starting our series on being the church. And over the next few weeks, I want to get us thinking about just how important GPC is to us in our lives, in our faith development, and in nurturing us, and to encourage us in our purpose, and that is to reach out and to share Christ with more people. I want us to think about how we can work together to make GPC the best that it can be. So it's not just Chris and I or the elders who do this, it's each one of you that contributes, that receives and gives, and I really want that to be our focus for the next few weeks. How can we participate fully in the opportunity that Christ has given us to be his body here in Glendowie? So this morning I wanted to get us thinking, and it's a great day to do this because of the storm, um, about how you would feel if only 20 people turned up to church. Okay, so I don't think that's ever happened in the time that I've been here, but I've been to churches where there's been only about 20 people. Just take a minute to think how different it would feel. And is someone brave enough to shout out, how do you think, what would be the difference? What would make it feel different than it does here? How would it feel different from the usual kind of bunch of people we have here? 
less energy. Perfect. What would you miss? Yeah, exactly. Nice loud singing, Judy said. It's beautiful when we join together. <laughs> yep, and that's a benefit of a small church. I think we can do that in our bigger church, though. One of the things that I would miss is there's not as many people to kind of gel with. There's not as many people to talk to after the service who can really um, speak into your life. And I was in a small church before, and, you know, it was beautiful in its own way, but there's really something special about more people coming together, that energy, that sense of everybody's there to encourage one another. And um, it's interesting as we think about the storm, I thought, how many people are going to turn up today? What's it going to feel like? And actually, there's quite a few of you faithful lot here who have braved the rain. So that's really, really cool. But it matters whether you come on a Sunday. This is the time that we all get together and we encourage each other and we build each other up and then we go back out to live in our own... um, in our own lives, in our own little spheres of influence. This is the chance where we all get to come together. I know we get together in our small groups, but this is where we all come together. And it really matters. When you're not here, we miss you. And it really does impact the the feeling of the service and the way in which our church operates. We love to be able to get everyone together on the same page, and it's so important to come along. So obviously, if you're at home and you're listening um, online, you're watching online and you can't come in, I'm totally not talking to you. You are so part of the community and I hope you really feel that. Um, But if um, if you're tempted not to come some weeks, I really urge you, come along. Being part of the church is the beautiful, one of the beautiful things is that we do get to be in these services together and encourage one another. So I want you to think about that as we continue on in our worship today and as Judy said one of the things that you miss when hardly anyone turns up is the beautiful beautiful singing together and that that sound of all of us joining together to worship God as his body so I pray that we do this as we continue next song it's a it's a new song some of you may may know it but it tells the story of God working in the world of uh, bringing light where there is no hope of seeing the trials and struggles of of his people in the world and bringing hope to them in the uh, this wonderful line um that you know jesus is, is resurrected and it says and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame um and it always gets me a little bit emotional i don't know why it's um it's, i don't get that emotional very often but for some reason just that the god calling into existence his church and filling it with his spirit and filling it with the the flame of love and hope uh, and and unity um, that only God can do. It's just something that really strikes a chord in in my heart. Um, And as we gather every Sunday, I love seeing everyone here. I love the conversations. I love love loud singing, how how great was how great thou art this morning. Um, And, you know, just honoring God and and blessing God and uh, fanning the flames of the spirit that are in our hearts together as God's people in this place is just an amazing blessing. Uh, and so she, look, can, we, can we stand and let's, let's sing the praise and glory and honor of God as he uh, kindles that spirit within you, uh, kindles that hope and that love and that unity as together the body of Christ we sing his praise. We were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Oh, 
loving and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation jesus for our sake you died mood for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all Shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Jesus, we praise you and we worship you and uh, we give you all honor and glory, Lord Jesus, in this place and in our lives and our hearts, Lord, and uh, with all we have, we give to you and, and worship you and honor you. And um, God, we're just so struck in, the, in awe at your great mercy and love. We worship you and we love you, Lord Jesus. down we lay the crowns at the feet of Jesus great is love your mercy and love at the feet of Jesus and we cry holy holy holy
This morning's Bible reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Unity and maturity in the body of Christ. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Please stay seated and sing that chorus one last time. Holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. And we cry, holy, holy, holy. Is the forgot to put on my microphone. All right, good morning again. <clears throat> oh, good morning again. All right, there we go. Awesome, awesome. Hey, it's so uh, wonderful to uh, be back, and uh, it's, uh, I just wanted to say um, a big thank you to uh, everyone who preached throughout um, this is a bit of a circus act, isn't it? Me trying to do my... It's why guys don't wear earrings. Well, I'd like, I don't wear earrings, should I say? Because um, it would be a mess. Look at me trying to figure out. I've got big floppy ears and it doesn't work. It's still not. It's under my face. It's just... This is why you prepare for things. And um... Oh, dear. Oh, dear. I've got it on the wrong way. All right, all right, I'm gonna. All right, Steph. There we go, all right. Now I can put my glasses back on. There we go. No, I think it's easier if I, if I hold it because I'll, I'll sort of move around a little bit. Can I start again? There we go. It's good to be back. It's uh, wonderful uh, to see you uh, and to be back up um, starting our series, looking at the church this morning. And uh, like I was trying to say, um, a big thank you to everyone uh, who preached through January. It's great to be able to have a, a break from, uh, from speaking and from preparing sermons and in the sense that one of the, the things that I find about ministry and about preaching is Sundays never stop coming. <laughs> Right? And so every Sunday um, it, it, it comes around and you've got a, a sort of 2,000 word essay to write and, um, and it's, it's a wonderful privilege but uh, it just doesn't stop coming. And if you have a holiday, Sunday still keeps coming. And um, so uh, thank you so much to, to Graham and to Rach and to Bill um, and um, is there anyone else? Ralph as well for, for speaking. Um, and uh, for encouraging us with their messages as well. If you haven't had a chance to, to listen to them, uh, I encourage you to go online and, and listen to those as well. So as Becky said, uh, we're starting a new series uh, this week for about eight weeks looking at the church and all different parts of the church, uh, what, what it means, what it is, what it isn't, um, and I really encourage you uh, to get involved in a small group study uh, that comes alongside of that, that will help us um, sort of fill out the study that we're doing on Sunday mornings. It helps you discuss some of the things that we're doing, uh, that we're speaking about, 
um, and, and really connects you, I think, with people. That's the, the wonderful thing about small groups is, is those connections of, of being the church, being the people of God together, of growing together. And so um, I really commend that to you. Um, get in touch with, with Becky. Um, is something going wrong? Am I, am I? If people aren't in the small group, there we go, contact the office. Now I'm just super self-conscious that everything is just kind of going wrong with me. Um, okay, I'm just going to use this one now. Now I'm just really, like, I'm, I'm awkward. Clearly I'm not meant. Can you hear me now? Microphone number three. There we go. Awesome. Awesome. All right, so it is an exciting opportunity looking at these studies. Um, this isn't a tone of the year, by the way, as well. This is all the cobwebs just coming out, and um, this year is going to be wonderful. So, um, yeah, it's an opportunity to look at different aspects of the church, what it means, um, what it means to belong to the church and to be, um, uh, to be a member and to be part of the body. And I think um, when we really understand what church is, when we understand its purpose, and then we begin to realize how amazing it is to be a part of a local church. Church, a church that is in the community, um, and you know that means GPC here. We are so privileged that we have this amazing community, this little um, peninsula that we have the opportunity to speak and to minister into. And when we understand our purpose of the church and, and God's equipping of us as the church, and um, that just becomes exciting. It becomes so cool to be a local church in a local place with local people ministering to the community. Um, and so, yeah, again. Uh, encourage you to be part of a small group to really flesh out what that means. And hopefully as we go through, we'll be talking about what the church is not. So we want to encourage you in what it means to be the church, but also we're going to hopefully dispel some things about what the church uh, isn't. Right? So it's not a building. It's, this, this isn't a building. This is the church building, but it's not the church. Uh, it's not a human idea. We didn't come up with it. Um, it's not a social club. Uh, it's not a place for Christian singles to meet their future spouses. Uh, although some of you may have done that, um, well done. Um, it often is the case. It's not even. A, it's not just a social club or a social justice club as well. Um, that, that's not what the church is. And so we're going to fill that picture out of what the church is and what its purpose is um, over the next few weeks. But there's also a number of reasons that, are, uh, uh, that people don't come to church or don't want to be a part of the church. Um, and uh, we want to address some of those as well. And, you know, a quick search or a quick conversation with people, um, and I'm sure you've had lots of these with your friends, you know, why don't you come to church? Why don't you go to church? Maybe they've said, why do you go to church? And then given you the litany of reasons as to why they don't want to go. Uh, and there's a lot, you know, uh, Christians are just hypocrites. Um, the perception that the church is just after your money. Uh, the idea that you have to be perfect before you go to church, that's a big one. Um, a number of, I don't know if you've had people go say this to you, and I've had over the last 10 years, so many people say, and it's usually guys, if I worked, walked through the doors of the church, God would like blitz me with lightning straight away. You know, and, th and they just think that they are so bad that um, they couldn't possibly step foot in a church building um, or, or be a part of the church. Another one is, is Christians are judgmental that we're going to condemn them. Um, and, and some of these things are serious misconceptions that people have and that we need to address and be, be better at, but um, uh, some of them aren't. Some of them are just things that people have made up in their own minds as well. So uh, hopefully uh, we can knock some of these off over the next eight weeks as well. So um, I probably should have done this right at the start. Things might have gone a bit more smoothly. Uh, let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, you are the head of the church. You are Lord of all, um, and you call us to, uh, to know you um, and to be your hands and feet in the world. Um, and, uh, God, that is a, a formidable task, um, Lord, that um, is a joy, uh, but, Lord, we, we don't take lightly as well. Uh, and, God, to think that uh, there are times where we've not lived up to your calling to be your people um, God, we want to repent from that, uh, but we want to look with, with hope and expectation uh, as to uh, what you could do in us um, when we, we realize and step into that calling that you've got for each of us. Uh, so God, speak to us this morning. 
um, and, and captivate our hearts for your vision uh, of your true church. So God, we pray this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, well, this morning I want to address um, the, the topic of what is the church. But as you can see, I've done it in a different sort of heading. Uh, that heading is church, not an option, gathered and called. Um, and, and I was trying to think of an illustration which would portray exactly what I was thinking about uh, being a part of the church and what it means to be called together as the church and the fact that it's, it's not an option for us. Um, you know, church isn't, being the church isn't a spectator sport. You don't sit on the sidelines. There are no subs. Uh, there are no reserves. We're all in the game. Um, and one of the things that I encountered when I was at uh, Bible college was people who, who said they didn't need the church. They didn't need to be a part of the church. You know, they, God had called them and they were a Christian and that was all that mattered. The church don't need it. Um, and so how, how can we sort of point to the fact that church isn't an option? And that's what the Bible says for us. And um, I came up with um, this illustration that I think portrays exactly what I'm, I'm trying to get across. And it's not perfect, and, and I get that. So um, talk to me afterwards if you see some holes in this illustration. But um, I want to use... I remembered this picture that my dad had taken of me and my brother and my sister when he'd taken us on a family holiday to Cape Reinga. And I was 14, so my brother was 15 and my sister was, was 13. Uh, and this is the picture that he took. This was a long time ago, so you might not recognize me. Fashions change, haircuts as well. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this was a time when cargo shorts were in fashion and, you know, Matrix-style sunglasses. Um, and, and as I said, I was 14 years old. You might not recognize me in this photo uh, because when my dad said we're going to take a photo, we're going to take a picture to remember our trip by, I deliberately turned around. <laughs> yep, that random guy leaning against the pole isn't a random guy. That is me. Uh, participating as much as I wanted to uh, in my family at the time. Uh, you may have heard me mention previously, I was a bit of an angry teenager. Um, I had a B or three in my bonnet. Uh, and at this particular point in time, uh, on our tiki tour around Northland, uh, the B in my bonnet was that I really didn't like my family at all. And from this photo, I didn't. you can see that I actually didn't really want to be a part of it. Uh, <laughs> and it wasn't just at this time. There, it was about two or three years where um, I really thought my family was redundant, right? I looked at them, and I didn't like what I saw. They did strange things. They stopped me listening to the music that I liked. Uh, they fundamentally disagreed with me on a whole raft of things uh, and just generally made me angry, they were the ones who made me angry, right? So I remember saying to mum one day that friends are more important than family um, and that because I have good friends, I don't need my family. And so looking back from 24 years down the road, um, I didn't actually treat them the way I should treat my family. And to anyone who took a close look at my behavior at the time, I didn't speak of them or act towards them in front of my friends um, as if I even really wanted to belong to them. You know, and I, I don't know how that hurt my, my mom and my dad, um, you know, but it, it kind of been easy. Um, and for, for many of us who are parents, um, maybe you've experienced something like that as well. But the truth was, whether I liked it or not, I had my family. They were mine and I was theirs. There was nothing I could do about it. Even if I changed my name, even if I moved countries, married whomever I married, mum and dad would still be my mum and my dad, and my brother and sister would still be my sis, brother and sister. My family would not change. I could act like they weren't my family, if I ignored them, if I neglected obligations toward them, uh, took them for granted, hated and despised them, uh, they were still my family, and there was nothing that I could do about it. Uh, and so 
we eventually did take a photo. I think that's probably more embarrassing than the other one because you can <laughs> see that, yes, it is me dressed in those clothes. Um, it wasn't my choice whether I got my family or not. Whether I felt like it, acted like it, spoke kindly about them, nothing changed the fact that I was in. I didn't bring myself into the family. I didn't choose them. They were my family. I was in, whether I liked it or not. And for me, this is the same comparison and an illustration of what it means to be a part of the church. As I said earlier, church isn't a building. It's not a service. It's not a sermon. It's not an organization or an institution. Many of you will know that uh, the word church is um, uh, that translated in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the Greek word ecclesia, meaning a gathering or an assembly. Its most common usage was in uh, the Roman Empire outside of Israel, uh, and it meant an assembly of citizens duly summoned. An assembly of citizens duly summoned. The church is the people of God whom he has called, he has gathered, or he has gathered together and assembled to himself. The church of Jesus Christ are the people that Jesus Christ has shed his blood for, whose sins are forgiven, and who have put their faith and trust in him, and God has called to them once and for all. And this isn't just the church uh, that we see here and now in 2023. God has been calling to himself a people to call his own for thousands of years. Back in Genesis, we see God starting to gather his people to him with Abraham and his family. He gathered his people on Mount Sinai to give them the law. It says he gathered the whole assembly. In the Greek Old Testament, it's the ecclesia, the church. He gathered the whole assembly of people to him. And he promised that he would be their God and they could be his people. He gathered for himself a remnant of exiles from around the uh, Babylonian and Syrian empires um, and, and called them back to himself. Jesus gathered to himself a gathering, an ecclesia of apostles. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, we read that Peter calls to the people to repent and to be baptized and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 39, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. It is God who calls the church. It is God who brings it into existence. It is God who gives us, as Ephesians says, the gift of grace and faith to believe in him. The church is called by God, filled with the unifying Holy Spirit. And as Gordon read, Paul affirms to the church, he says, bear with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. For there is only one body, there is only one Spirit, just as you were called to the hope that belongs to you. Pardon me, to, to your call. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. We have all been called as people, as God's people, into God's church once and for all. Our sins are forgiven. We have been united with Christ. We have died with him in his death. We have risen with him in his resurrection, resurrection glory. We are seated with him in the holy of holies for all eternity, sealed with the blood of Christ. And there's nothing we can do about it. You can't stop it. The true church, we talk about the true, uh, the true church, the invisible church, um, the church and the visible church and the invisible church. Uh, Paul mentions this in, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, not exactly using those words, but he acknowledges that the true church, the true believers of Jesus Christ, only God knows. Those are the ones who are sealed forever, who cannot leave the church, who cannot uh, ever be lost. And that there are some, as Jesus says, sheep and wolves who come in to steal and destroy, um, who are amongst the church as well. But there's this, this idea that the true church, those who are called and have, the faith, have faith in Jesus Christ, cannot be lost. We are in whether we like it or not. We are gathered and called by God for his glory. In our own time, too, God has called us, therefore, 
into his church, to gather together. The author of um, Hebrews says that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses stretching back to the history of God's people. Here and now we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses because we are united with them, gathered as God's people across time and space and history. And where God calls his people, his people are compelled by the Spirit to gather, even where there is no visible church present. I've heard numerous stories of, the, of how God has been working in countries where Christians are murdered and executed for their faith, where God has spoken to people in their dreams and brought them together to be his people, gathered as his church, even if it is underground for a time. And so the church is the people. It's you. It's me. It's those who have gone before us who are united together with us through the power of the Spirit. It is the people whom God has called into his church, into his body. Jesus has told us in Matthew 16, I will build my church. What that means is that if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, church is not an option. Being the people of God is not an option. Because it's not a service, because it is who you are, because it is your identity, it's not an option. It's who you are. Just like being a part of your family is not an option, being the church is not an option. It's not something that you can opt in and out of. It's not something that you can go to on a Sunday morning or not go to. It's something that you don't leave for 167 hours a week and then step back in for one hour a week. You are the church all day Sunday. You are the church at your home with your family. You are the church on Monday to Friday when you're at work, when you're on the bus, in your car, in the pub, playing sports, watching your kids' sports, looking after your grandkids. Church isn't an option. You're in. You can't get out. And sometimes, though, we buy into these mistruths about the church, don't we? Some of those things that I mentioned first. I have to be perfect to be the church. I don't really want to get to know people because what if they see the true me? What if they see my flaws and my imperfections? What if they know? It might take more than just an hour on a Sunday if I really get involved. Sometimes we think, well, it's only the people in the service, running the service that matter. I'm not really that important to the church. It's only the professionals who really matter or count. That my ministry is just the one that I'm rostered for (laughs) because it takes place in church. And just like me as a teenager with my family. It doesn't matter if you like the church or not. If you think I'm weird, if you think my taste in music is crazy, if you think I dress badly, sorry, you've got no choice. (laughs) Jesus is the one who's chosen us. Jesus is the one who's called us together for a reason for a purpose, for his glory. Same is true for each and every one of us as Jesus' followers. If we are followers of Jesus, if we are Christians, exactly the same thing, then we are a part of the church. As I said, some of my friends at Bible college had all these negative perspectives on the church and and refused to go to services, refused to engage with their local church. Um, And to to be fully honest, I think their experience in that time of their lives was poorer for it. Uh, And there was a sense that they were immature in their faith despite being at Bible college and doing theological degrees. But just like when I was a teenager, I didn't stay there forever, praise God. I didn't stay angry 
forever. I didn't dress that badly forever, right? Um, I grew to love my family. I matured through my teenage years and became a young adult. And I really valued the fact that they'd stuck with me. That they loved me even when I'd said really nasty, horrible things. Because they had brought me through that angry stage to a place of maturity and given me the ability to grow as a man and find my place in the world. I was able to find my place in my family. I could choose to grow. I could choose to walk with my family and reach a better place for myself and a better place with them. I could mature to be a man and I could let them go and be who they wanted to be as well. If I had walked away, if I had or was able to abandon my family, I would miss out on the fundamental aspects of who I am today. And in the long run, it would affect how my own family, with our children, with Becky, is built and affected. And so just like each of us, perhaps, as we've gone through our teenage years, as we've matured, we have an opportunity to stand and see the church as our family. It's a wonderful metaphor in the Bible as well uh, for, for church. But we don't have to be teenagers. We don't have to simply have an immature view of church as the service or the minister or the building or all of those things. But we can fully embrace the church as God's people, as my spiritual family. Regardless of whether we like what we see or not, we can choose to be a part of it. God is calling us to take ownership of who he has called us to be as his people, as his church, and to grow together in love and in grace through the power of his Holy Spirit. To gather together, to be the church, literally the gathered people of God, to be the body of Christ, another metaphor, not a single amputated limb by itself sitting over there, to be a family of God, not an individual going in my own direction. So as we begin this series, we want you to know that you are the church. And it is beautiful and it is glorious. Through its mess and through its difficulty, God has called you, has called us, has gathered us to be his people. Not just here in Glendowie, not just Auckland, not just New Zealand, not just 2023, but he's called us to be a part of his people across time, space, and history to bring his kingdom purposes here and now. So as we come to a time of response, and we're going to sing a couple more songs of worship, let's invite the Holy Spirit to minister to us now. Because I know that there are some of us who have some hang-ups about church. Maybe you've been hurt by church in the past. Maybe it has been the minister who's hurt you. Maybe it's actions of fellow brothers and sisters. The hypocrisy of the church. Maybe you've thought you could opt in and opt out, spend the 167 hours a week not being the church and just that one being the church. Perhaps now you're just realizing how you are intimately linked with everyone else in this room, who are your spiritual family, who share the moment of Jesus' death for you, his resurrection on your behalf, and his ascension to glory with you. At the very least, as believers, that is what we share, that moment of Christ's death resurrection and our salvation we are intimately linked as brothers and sisters maybe there are some barriers that do need to come down when it comes to church you don't have to be perfect you don't christ is perfect and he's building his church which means he's building you maybe you need to grow in your involvement 
in that maturity to stand up and move forward and take action. Join a home group. Commit to regular attendance. Maybe you need prayer. Whatever it is, let the Holy Holy, Holy Spirit speak to you now and minister to your heart as we come to him in worship. Please join with me for a prayers of intercession. Thank you that we can come to you and ask on behalf of others. We need you every day, but today it is particularly clear how much we need you. In our own region and land, we ask for your protection for our families and friends, neighbours and fellow citizens, and for ourselves from damage from this coming cyclone. We know that you are over nature, and in the same way as you calm the storms on the Sea of Galilee, you have also have power over this. So we ask for mercy, repeating the confidence of your servant, King David. God is our refuge and strength, and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way 
and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters rape, foam and roar, sorry, roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Looking overseas, we grieve and our hearts go out to those who are suffering in Turkey and Syria from the recent earthquakes. We pray for the cooperation of all parties for the common good. We rejoice that the Syrian authorities are now letting relief into the regions that aren't under their control. And we thank you for the commitment of various relief groups of all persuasions who are working to preserve life. Continue to encourage and bring them what they need, even when the world's media becomes distracted by other events. And touch us, we pray, to respond to these needs as you lead. We hear of wars and insurrections, rebellions, armed resistance and lawlessness. We do our best, as Jesus commanded, not to be alarmed. Instead, we pray for those involved, particularly for those who are suffering. Meet their needs, we pray, and bring comfort, strength and healing. Please thwart evil purposes and expose emotions of greed, vengeance and ethnic hatred to the light of your truth. We pray that political leaders who want to have it both ways for whatever political or commercial profit they want would be confronted to do the right thing. And we pray against that hardening of positions that put prideful principles before actual needs and realities. Give participants in these struggles the grace to step back when it makes sense to do so. We pray for the testimony and vitality of the church worldwide. Where there is pressure on believers, we pray for grace and strength, particularly when your people suffer violence because of their testimony and resistance to the claims of ideologies and faith that deny the authority of your son. And where the suffering is costly, we pray that your people would sense your continued grace and provision so that they can stand firm in their faith to whatever the end is. Where pressure is more subtle as in the West, we pray for a sharp appreciation of the spiritual warfare that is going on in our hearts and wallets. We also pray for the, about the greater danger to your people, namely the corruption of our faith by false doctrine and unbalanced teaching, teaching that misrepresents you and your ways. While we pray especially for teachers and leaders, we pray that your discerning spirit would be working in the lives of all believers to identify and reject teaching that leads them to put their faith in anything other than salvation by grace through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Or teaching that waters down your demands for holiness and morality, ethics and stewardship. Expose false teaching, we pray, whatever pulpit it comes from. We pray for our brothers and sisters in this congregation as we seek to reach our community for you. Give grace to the leaders you have set over us. Give grace and healing to those who are unwell. For those who are dear to us, who are not walking with you, we ask that you would continue to work in their lives through your spirit. And in a moment of silence, we bring to you other burdens that are on our hearts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers. In the darkness we were waiting, without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son. Kingdom come. 
loving and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who Thank you, Ralph, for leading us in those beautiful prayers today. And uh, thank you to our worship team for leading us in the songs. And that was a particularly wonderful new song. So thank you for learning that and putting the effort into helping us along to do that. Um, we have another opportunity to pray coming up right now. Um, so from here, we've got Brad's meeting for the parents from Glendowie School. Uh, everyone else can grab a quick cuppa so I don't have to kind of crack the whip to get you back in here um, to do our prayers. And um, I'd like to end now uh, with this verse. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. And of course, if you need prayer for something in particular, we've got people to pray with you up the front right now.
Oh, 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 oh,